continue to talk about topic of demographics that a lot of people find um, maybe less than exciting, though in higher ed, it has gotten a little bit exciting to the point where I think it is notable that you all are willing to start your time talking about um, a topic that does bring some challenges. In fact, I saw a Washington Post article a few years ago where someone in the Northeast said that when they look at the demographic changes coming, they view the mid-2020s as the apocalypse. Now, I saw that and I thought that's a, an almost uniquely unhelpful metaphor. Um, there's got to be uh, something other than just going home and spending time with loved ones that we can do about this. And so I will talk about some things that I see higher ed doing to respond to this challenge that we face and hopefully leave you with a more constructive metaphor at the end. So let's look a little bit about the demographic challenge that we're facing and how we got here. So demographic change has been with us for a long time. All of you uh, have probably been experiencing it as long as you've been in the profession. Uh, we see it, for instance, in some slow moving demographic changes that have to do with the composition of the country. So this graphic comes from William Frey's work at the Brookings Institution. He's using census data to project when we reach the tipping point in our country, that is when we are no longer majority non-Hispanic white. For the country as a whole, Frey estimates we'll hit that point in 2045, so around mid-century, but younger cohorts are more diverse. And so the tipping point happens sooner. And in fact, if we look at those who are under age 18, uh, Frey estimates that we passed the tipping point in 2020 when we were all busy focused on, on the pandemic. We're similarly seeing some shifts in composition in terms of geography. So young families with children have been moving uh, for a number of years off the West Coast, out of the Northeast, toward the South and Southwest. And all of those things are contributing to a slow and persistent change in higher education. In fact, if you go to the Digest of Education statistics, you'll see that in the year 2000, over 70% of first-time, full-time undergraduate students were non-Hispanic white, whereas in the most recently available data from the early 2020s, we see that it's just north of 50%. So we've already seen some substantial change, but it's been slow and slow moving. What's coming next might be a little bit less slow moving, and that has to do with the fertility numbers that Heather alluded to. So this map shows the total fertility rate in 2007, right on the precipice of the Great Recession. Um, the total fertility rate measures how many babies will be born to women if they follow the fertility patterns that we see across age groups at a particular point in time. So for 1,000 women to replace the population just with fertility alone, demographers estimate we need about 2,100 babies to be born. And we can see relative to that replacement rate where the state stood in 2007. All of the states in blue here had fertility rates in excess of that replacement rate. But all the orange states had um, sub-replacement rate levels of fertility. And you can see that the northeast quadrant of the country, even in 2007, had low, below replacement fertility. And so as a consequence, when Heather says that some are experiencing the demographic cliff even now, often those bylines come from the northeast quadrant of the country where we've had low fertility and then that's been amplified by out-migration that's contributed to a, a decline in young people of college-going age even today. But then the financial crisis hit. And so while the country at this time in 2007 was above the replacement rate as a whole, well, we ceased to be as we went through the Great Recession. And at this point now, we have more than a decade of uh, decline. Uh, we're actually pushing past 15 years of decline in the numbers of babies being born. So this data comes from the CDC. You can see that after decades of rising numbers of babies being born, in 2007, we started a decline that's now uh, over 15%. Um, in 2020, we saw a decline of 4% alone before there was a rebound into 2021 that brought us back closer to where we were in, in 2019. The 2022 data is still only provisional but it looks like it's gonna be about the same as in 2021. So if we think about young people of traditional college going age at 18 years, and we're looking at babies being born today who are gonna be arriving on our campuses in the early 2040s, which is just another way of saying that this decline in the number of young people, this contraction in the birth cohorts is something that we're gonna be contending with for the foreseeable future. Kenneth Johnson at the University of New Hampshire has tried to estimate the cumulative effect of this decline in fertility. So in red here, he plots the actual births, so that's the same CDC data that you just saw. And in blue, he plots what he estimates would have happened had we maintained fertility rates at 2007 levels. And you can see that because we had a rising number of young women of um, prime fertility bearing age, had fertility rates stayed the same, we would have seen an increase in the number of babies, but instead we saw the decline that we witnessed. And at this point, it's totaled more than nine and a half million delayed or foregone births. 
And so there's a cumulative impact on our campuses as well. It's not just that we can anticipate seeing a contraction in the size of our cohorts, but that year after year, we're gonna see these contractions. And that of course has some financial consequence. If we update that map using the exact same color scheme, we can see that the low fertility rates have now spread throughout the country. Um, there are no states now that exceed the total replacement rate. Uh, there's still a geographic component. The lowest fertility rates can continue to be in the Northeast, but now we see very low fertility rates throughout the country. And so we can anticipate some real challenges to the future of higher education recruitment. Now, I think when I say anticipate, that's maybe not the right word, because I would argue that people have been noting the challenge already for a number of years. Here's Sarah Lipka writing back in 2014 in the Chronicle about how just until just a few years ago, she says colleges could anticipate larger and larger classes, but those days are over. So here she's not speaking of a decline in the number of babies being born. She's talking about being on a plateau. And she's arguing that that plateau itself is a problem. And I think that's right, that the real paradigm shift is when we move from a world of ever increasing numbers of young people to one of stasis. At that point, we can't paper over less than best practices by just recruiting a few extra students. Instead, we have to really contend with the scarcity of new students that exist. And while declining student numbers presents new and deeper challenges, in some sense, we've been experiencing, as we've been on the plateau for a couple of years here, some of the tightness um, that really starts to mark a, a paradigm shift, a new world where we need to think hard about some of our practices. So I'm guessing most of you have seen the data that introduced me to this topic, which is data from the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. Uh, that data is trying to project the number of high school graduates. And we can see in that data um, the decline that, that follows from the decline in fertility. Um, but one of the challenges with that data is that we get the same data regardless of institution type, whether we're community college or a highly selective four-year institution. And it seems like those might be different submarkets. It's possible that one submarket might be growing while another is shrinking and so on. And so in my research, what I did was to use Department of Education longitudinal study data to predict the probability of college attendance um, or more accurately to describe the probability of college attendance in the recent past. So I was using a cohort of young people who became of traditional college going age in the year 2013. And then I asked, what if we continue to see that college going behavior into the future as we experience the demographic changes that we can already see in the babies who've been born? And so what I'm gonna project next um, is, is this projection exercise, this what if exercise. What if we all continue to behave the same way? We as institutions and families all engage with higher education in exactly the same way. What would happen to the market for higher education? And so in each of these four panels, we have four different sub-regions of the country. These are the census regions. So we've got the West, the South, the Midwest, and the Northeast. In the upper left corner, we have a depiction of uh, the number of young people with demographic markers that in the recent past have been associated with attending a two-year institution. So here they're all, the data are all represented relative to 2018. So a value of 90%, for instance, indicates a 10% decline relative to 2018 levels. In the upper right, we have the same concept, the number of young people with demographic markers projected to attend this time regional four-year institutions. That is, four-year institutions not ranked among the top 100 colleges or universities. The bottom two panels have the same concept of projected numbers of young people, now with demographic markers of attending in the national institutions, is the case of those institutions ranked 51 to 100 on the two US news national lists. And in the bottom right hand corner, we have um, the projections for the top 50 colleges and universities. As you look across these panels, I think we can see some things that are in common across all four submarkets. First, we can see that consistently the Midwest and the Northeast are weaker right out of the bat. In fact, even now they're experiencing some decline in general uh, before we reach the mid 2020s when we expect to feel a deeper decline resulting from that contraction of fertility. That speaks to the weak demographic situation that the Midwest and the Northeast have been in prior to the rest of the country joining them during the Great Recession. The second thing that we see is that in all four submarkets, there's a contraction that takes place in the mid 2020s. And that's just the echo of the declining numbers of young people being born. But as we look across these four panels, you can also see that in upper two panels, 
we have more or less stasis followed by decline, whereas in the bottom two panels, we have sort of a rising tide against which we have this contraction. So why that difference? Why are the more selective institutions projected to have an easier go of it? And that speaks to a different compositional change. In particular, it's the access agenda and the success that we've had over recent decades. During this time period, we have parents who are becoming more and more educated. We have a larger share of young people who are considering college and their parents have been to college. And parents who have bachelor's degrees are more likely to send their young people to college and four-year colleges more specifically and even more particularly to selective four-year institutions. And so that compositional shift accounts for this rising tide against which we have these uh, contractions that echo the Great Recession. Now, it should be noted, the top two panels represent the lion's share of higher education. Uh, the vast majority of students attend either a two-year institution or a regional four-year institution. And so it's not surprising that those top two panels track very closely to what's going on in the high school projections that you see from the WICHE. And so for institutions that find themselves either a two-year institution or as a regional four-year institution, I would argue the, the WICHE data provide a pretty good template for what one might expect to happen next. And the nuance that I hope I'm providing is, is by seeing that there are some differences in the subcomposition of the society, in particular, the numbers of young people who might be attracted to more selective forms of higher ed. We can also look at the projections and see who is in the pool. Uh, so here we're looking at the distribution by race and ethnicity. In the left two bars, we're just looking at 18 year olds as a whole. And this is the story that you all have seen in the news and in so many other contexts. Uh, the two bars represent a recent past cohort of college attenders and then a not too distant future cohort. And we're seeing the distribution shifting so that non-Hispanic whites fall below 50%. So that black share, the non-Hispanic white share is falling below 50% during this time period. And largely that change in composition is driven by an increase in the share of Hispanic Americans. So the yellow uh, portion of the bar. As we move over to the right, we see the same kind of analysis looking to a recent past cohort and a not too distant future cohort for first two-year institutions. And then we're looking at the three subparts of the uh, four-year market. I think it's important to note that in each sub-market here, we see that the share of non-Hispanic whites, that's the height of the black bar, is shrinking. All parts of higher education can anticipate a future that is more diverse than the present. In addition, I think as you look across these four bars, you see that the, the composition of racial diversity isn't all the same. Um, so for instance, when we look at the distribution in the market for two-year institutions, we see a near echo of what's going on in the population as a whole. And this is because two-year institutions really do reach a largely representative cut of the American population. By contrast, as we look at the four-year market, and we in particular look toward more selective forms of four-year higher education, we get slightly rep less representative samples. And so as a result, when we look at the most selective institutions, we see the diversification comes in the form of both rising Hispanic share and a rising share of Asian Americans. Now it should be noted that in this decomposition here, we're looking at the young people who have markers of attending these institutions as in the past. It's not clear to me that we're going to see that selective institutions expand their seats just because their pool is increasing. We have seen some highly selective institutions expanding seat counts, and I think we can understand why since the demand in that part of the market is probably increasing, but they may not increase their pool at all. And if they do so, they might not do so in a way that follows the distribution of the students in the pool, uh, though the recent Supreme Court decision suggests that we might see that the uh, the pool in the, I'm sorry, the, the pool and the admitted students groups look more similar than they have in the past. In addition to these demographic forces, I think we should acknowledge that we're also seeing some other economic forces that are going to compound the challenge that we face. So for instance, recently we've seen research out of uh, UMass Amherst and MIT documenting a compression in wages. So here in red, we see what's happened to the 10th percentile wages. These are low wage workers in the US economy. In the blue, we see the 90th percentile. And what we see here is that there's been very modest growth over the last um, five to 10 years in the 90th percentile that is top wage earning bracket. By contrast, there's been substantial growth in wages at the bottom. Now you can see that there was a big jump in wages right around the time of the pandemic. And it does seem post pandemic that the pandemic itself has heightened this compression, but the compression actually predates uh, the pandemic. The reason I point this out is because when we see that the bottom wages are growing faster than the top, 
we're also likely seeing a decline to the return to a college degree. Now, the changes that you see here are not enough to upend the story that the return on investment to a higher education degree is strong. It still is a strong investment, but I think it does speak to something that recently young people are experiencing. They see jobs that don't require a college degree that are paying a lot more than they did in the recent past. And it's raising some questions about whether or not college attendance is the right um, the right idea. Now, to some degree, those conversations happening right now reflect the really low unemployment rate that we're facing. But as we look at what's happening with wage compression, I think we might be looking at a more persistent change. We're seeing unions, for instance, become stronger. And that suggests that even when the next recession comes, and inevitably it will come, that the situation for low income uh, workers might be better than it otherwise would be. And that means that we might not experience the same changes in the number of young people who are interested in higher ed. So we face some real challenges. We have some forces due to demographics, and we have some forces due into the economy, and it paints a picture of some challenge as we move into the decade ahead. But thankfully, I don't think that this is the apocalypse. I think we have a lot of agency, and there are ways that higher ed can respond. And so before we turn to the Q&A time and some discussion, I want to just highlight a few ways that institutions are proactively responding to the demographic change. So first, if the domestic market is weak, Perhaps we want to look outside the domestic market. We might turn to international students in particular. Here we have data from the Institute of International Education presenting the number of new international students at both graduate and undergraduate level. So the yellow here depicts the undergraduate numbers. And we can see, unfortunately, that there's been a decline in new international undergraduate students. Now, yes, part of the decline is COVID. We can see a deep drop during that time period. But you can see that we were already on a downward slide before that. Sometimes people point to the Trump administration and some uh, regulations that they were passing that made visas difficult to attain. And that certainly is true. But if you look at the timing here, the decline actually predates the Trump administration. The first down year was in the fall of 2016. Those matriculation decisions were made when Obama was president and everyone was pretty sure it was going to be a Clinton presidency to follow. So I think the decline that we're seeing here, while it has to do with a lot of factors, should point us also to recognize that the international student market is highly competitive. And so for institutions that are turning to this market, and some will and some will succeed, we certainly don't want to approach it as, it's, as if it were a light switch. We simply have to flip the switch and we can get international students. This is a market that we're going to have to work for. In particular, we're seeing increased competition from the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, even India and China themselves are creating institutions to compete with our own. So if we're going to turn to the international market, we're going to have to work for those students. Secondly, we might turn to new domestic student groups. And the message here is basically the same. This is indeed possible, and indeed it's right that we look at the access agenda, we see who we aren't serving. But as we do, we need to recognize it's not simply enough to say we're going to invite new student groups to come. We're going to have to think about how we need to change our practices to meet those students. So here's Pam Edinger talking in the two-year uh, college context about the turn to the non-traditional student age group. So if the number of traditional age students is shrinking, perhaps we should diversify our student portfolio to include uh, adults as well. And she points out that as we do that work, we need to provide professional development so that we don't simply have faculty and staff who get caught asking the questions, why aren't you bringing me the right students? By which I mean, why aren't you bringing me the students who brought me last year? And here, obviously, your offices can't directly do this, but I would argue that you need to find good partners on the academic side of the house to help with that professional development, again, for both faculty and staff, so that they can see what it is that the market is requiring of us, and that we can contemplate how do we need to change our pedagogies so that we can meet these new student needs. I think sometimes that requires some modest change, but other times it's going to ask us to really dig into our questions of self-identity as institutions. And so I offer up this example, um, not as an example of this is what all of us should do, but rather this is an attitude that all of us need to contemplate. So Drake University in Iowa um, was looking and recognizing that in their Des Moines market, there were students who they were not serving who really needed to be served. Um, and the reason they weren't able to serve them is because Drake was a four-year institution without two-year degrees, and these students really required a two-year on-ramp. There's several ways one can respond. You can partner with a two-year institution. In this case, Drake felt that um, it would be better for the students if there were two-year degrees offered within the university, and then students could seamlessly transfer from the two-year degree program to the four-year degree programs as appropriate. So I offer this up because I recognize that at my own institution, if we talked about offering two-year degrees, it would uh, initiate a very, very heated conversation about our identity. 
we don't offer two-year degrees. That's not who we are. And we probably would have a lot of conversations about that. And I'm not arguing that's inherently wrong, but rather what I'm arguing is that what Drake did here by initiating this conversation is right. Um, in particular, it's an attitude that says we need to contemplate what aspects of our identity are core and what aspects are our, of our identity might need to shift in order to meet students where they are at. Now, recruitment is probably not going to be the sole solution here. Um, when we think about a decline in the number of young people um, now in excess of 15 percent, it's not plausible to me that matriculation rates will go up enough to offset the decline in the pool sizes. So if we want to maintain enrollments, we might want to look at student success as well. Um, so we're seeing attention to student success on a number of fronts. University of Southern Maine has really leaned into traditional advising models, face-to-face -face lengthy advising meetings to figure out what students need in order to succeed. Um, at Cal State University in Dominguez Hills, they're working on the sense of belonging through a male success alliance. They're in particular targeting uh, men and, and their high dropout rates in order to try to figure out how they can draw those students better into the community so that they can persist and succeed. At Rutgers, they're thinking creatively about how to use the student employment system as a nexus for academic advising and mentorship. So they're training up student work supervisors and select jobs that hire large numbers of students in order so that that can be an on-ramp to academic support and other persistence and retention augmenting uh, interventions. So there are a lot of ways we might do this. So as we get ready to uh, move into the, the question and answer period in the discussion, I want to leave you with that constructive metaphor that I promised. So this comes from um, Ed Vennett, who in a blog post noted Tlaib's book on anti-fragility. Uh, anti-fragility, notes Tlaib, goes beyond resilience or robustness. And I think the point he's making here is that when we experience stress, Many of us recognize immediately that we don't want to break. That's a response to stress that's bad. So I don't want to break. And instead, we might reflexively aim for resilience or robustness. And sometimes, admittedly, that's all we can hope for. But Tlaib notes there's a third possibility. While the resilient resists shocks and stays the same, like a turtle, you're just pulling into your shell and hoping the, the stress will wash over you, leaving you unchanged, the anti-fragile system gets better. So for instance, when you go work out in the gym or you step on a treadmill, the idea is you're putting your body under stress so that through that stress, you'll come out with a stronger muscular system, a stronger, a stronger skeletal system, stronger cardiovascular system. Similarly, might higher education become, or is it already an anti-fragile system? So as we experience these demographic challenges, and for that matter, some of the market forces that we see today, might in... 2045, we look back and not say that was an easy time or that was a fun time in higher ed, but perhaps rather we would say, looking back, we were pressed to pursue access with greater uh, urgency. We created clear connections between the academy and student lives, something that we know improves su uh, success. We increased retention rates and persistence. We collaborated with our peers where appropriate in order to gain necessary efficiencies. And as a result, while it wasn't necessarily an easy run, uh, we find ourselves stronger and better fulfilling our missions. And if we can do that, I think we'll be pretty proud of ourselves and it'll be a relatively satisfying end. So with that, I thank you for your time and your attention and I look forward to the conversation. Yeah.